Let's tell Floyd Mayweather TBE once again. Now, Floyd Mayweather said he's the best boxer ever, and he said he was a better boxer than Muhammad Ali, to which detractors of Floyd Mayweather, for example, Skip Bayless, they say Floyd Mayweather never fought an all-time great or a great fighter in their prime. He said Shane Mosley, for instance, was past his prime, and Oscar De La Hoya was past his prime, yet the great Muhammad Ali, he faced Joe Fraser, Ken Norton, George Foreman, just to mention three great names. Some people, they say, he cherry-picked these guys. He picked them when they were past their prime, and then he fought them, right? Let's see if this is all true, okay? So let's start off with... Did Floyd Mayweather pick these guys to fight them at the time he fought them? Do you believe that the fight with Arturo Gatti will come off in June if he wins next week? I'm going to keep my fingers crossed. It's a good fight next week. Arturo Gatti is a, a, a tough opponent. I want to fight the best they got out there. I would love to fight Constance Zoo. Arturo Gatti, the best out there. And I hear that Shane Mosley is coming down to 147. I hear Oscar De La Hoya is coming up down to 147 for Floyd Mayweather is willing to go to 147 and fight Shane or fight Oscar De La Hoya. You heard it right there. Now, you can tell from the time that is stated, which is 2005, that Floyd Mayweather just finished a fight and seemed to have won. He's speaking about facing a Turo Gatti and keeping his fingers crossed. So let's just look in box right here. What was the fight before he faced a Turo Gatti? And if you do look, the fight before he faced a Turo Gatti was the fight with Henry Brussels or Brussels. And that was in January, the 22nd of January of 2005. So he had just finished that fight. And it so happens, if you look at the weight class, Floyd Mayweather was in the 140 weight class known as light welterweight or junior welterweight. But yet he was talking about a fight at welterweight right if you check the video so that means that Floyd was willing to go up in weight class and face uh, Shane Mosley or Oscar De La Hoya in 2005 very important for you guys to understand now let's just go back to this uh, interview here and see what else transpires what do the commentators after Larry Manchard's interview with Floyd Mayweather what do the commentators have to say what does Jim Lampley and Roy Jones Jr. have to say listen carefully you mentioned uh, uh, Oscar De La Hoya Shane Mosley, Mosley Costa Zoo I don't know if I were Oscar De La Hoya or Shane Mosley if I'd even want to give Floyd Mayweather a chance against me at well, 147 pounds well because he had everything to gain and nothing to lose and they would have everything to lose and nothing to gain exactly so that would be really a dumb fight for either one of those guys but you never know what happens in this game money talks and you never know if Mayweather were to get a chance to beat Costa Zoo and do it maybe he'd be a big enough star that the money would make it so that, that would be a good fight I would also like to see him maybe take on a person like a Zab Judah. Alright. Here we hear both Jim Lampley and Roy Jones Jr. are saying it wouldn't make sense for Oscar De La Hoya or Shane Mosley to face Floyd Mayweather Jr. And in fact, Oscar De La Hoya never responded to facing Floyd Mayweather Jr. And neither did Shane Mosley. In 2005, January 22nd, Floyd expressed his desire to face Oscar De La Hoya and Shane Mosley. And Roy Jones Jr. suggests that he faced a Zab Judah, who was Zab Judah at the time in 2005, was a welterweight. And true to form, Floyd did face Zab Judah, not but a year later. He faced a Zab Judah in 2006, and he beat a Zab Judah. And then he went on to beat the welterweight, who had beaten Zab Judah, Carlos Baldomir, who was the lineal welterweight weight champion, and he took his title. But before he faced Carlos Baldomir, Shane Mosley was interviewed by Larry Merchant after Shane Mosley at that time came off a win to Fernando Vargas. It was his second fight with Fernando Vargas, a rematch, in which he defeated Fernando Vargas in six rounds, knocking him out. And in 2006, Floyd Mayweather had beaten Zab Judah April of that year. Two months before, Shane Mosley beat Fernando Vargas. And the interesting thing about that is, just less than five months uh, before that, he had faced Fernando Vargas. 
So it wasn't really beyond Shane Mosley to face Floyd Mayweather four months later. Here's what Shane Mosley had to say when confronted by Larry Merchant with the proposition that he faced Floyd Mayweather. Given that Shane Mosley said that he wouldn't face Floyd Mayweather, he wouldn't come down to welterweight that year. By the way, it's very important to understand that Shane Mosley faced Fernando Vargas at super welterweight, which is a 154-pound limit, okay? He wasn't facing him at welterweight. So Shane Mosley was saying, well, it would take me a little something to come down and wait, right? So let's just hear what Shane Mosley has to say there. This sensational knockout can change the landscape for you. Now, earlier you had issued almost categorical statements that you would not fight Floyd Mayweather at welterweight this year. This kind of performance can explode that in terms of people wanting to see it. So, if there is the possibility of making a huge payday, maybe the biggest one you've ever made. Would you reconsider your earlier statements? Well, I mean, you, you never know uh, what happens, but I know that, you know, I plan to go on trips and stuff like that, even before this, uh, before this fight. And, you know, a fight in November, I don't know about being able to properly uh, train in November, so that's why I said next year will be a perfect opportunity for me to uh, just up in the room with a Floyd Mayweather. So the door is a little bit open if somebody should lay an offer on the table for you next week. Definitely. I mean, you know, I know there's uh, you know, there's a fight in November and he has that card in November. I mean, you know, Margarita sitting out there waiting for for an opportunity and he's one of the, the next top welterweights out there. What well, they go ahead and fight and next year, I mean me and Floyd can meet up after that fight. Well, wouldn't that possibly interfere with the plans of your boss uh, or partner, uh, Oscar De La Hoya? to fight him next May, why not seize the opportunity now if it comes along? Well, I don't know. Like I said, I mean, you know, as I'm as I'm sitting here, my tooth is a little loose right now. I'm trying to figure out if I got to go to the dentist and, and, and give me some dentures in a second. Um, so you can't think ahead to Monday. So I can't even. think ahead. You know, I've been feeling my tooth right now. It's, it feels it like it's coming out. It looks right. like, it, like it's coming out. So I'm, I got to see what's going on, you know? All right. Thank you very much, Shane. Congratulations on an outstanding performance. Now, some people mock Shane Mosley and say, oh, he's using the tooth excuse. But really, what happened was Shane Mosley was saying that his training regimen is not one in which he's going to be fighting in November. Shane Mosley, generally speaking, he did fight in November. He fought against Winky Wright in November. That is true. But if you look, he fought before that in the month of March. Okay, so he had eight months to prepare for Winky Wright for like twice a year, generally speaking. Here again, twice a year, he faced David Estrada in April, and then in September, he faced Jose Luis Cruz. So, Mosley fighting two, two fights a year, true to form, Mosley did fight the following year. Now, he did fight a welterweight in Luis Colazo. Okay, he did fight a welterweight, but still, nonetheless, he did fight the following year, like he said he was going to do. And you remember, fighters do plan and arrange things. So as much as people use it as, oh, Mosley had a tooth excuse, really and truly, Mosley fights two times a year. He wasn't gonna fight a third time in a year. He said it in advance, before Larry Merchant had interviewed him, he said he couldn't face Floyd Mayweather that year. But my point is this, people say Mayweather pick and choose Mosley in 2010, when actually it takes two to want to make a fight. Mayweather wanted to face Shane Mosley, but Shane Mosley at the time was not interested in facing Floyd Mayweather at that time. Floyd Mayweather was available and Mosley knew this, Mosley was talking about it, because Mayweather beat Zab Judah in April of the year, Mosley had beaten Fernando Vargas. So November 11th was available for Mosley to face Floyd Mayweather, okay? But Mosley wasn't going to face Floyd Mayweather. And that's the important point for you guys to understand. And so Mayweather ended up facing Carlos Baldemir, who was the actual guy that beat Zab Judah. And as the video stated, he then faced Oscar De La Hoya. But here's the interesting thing about the whole thing. Floyd had expressed his desire to face these guys in January the 22nd of 2005. And it took him two years, or over two years, to face Oscar De La Hoya. And it took him five years before he was able to get the opportunity to face Shane Mosley. And this was coming off the Marquez win 
Mosley bum rushed him and said, let's make this fight. And Floyd was not interested in fighting Shane Mosley at the time. He wanted to fight Manny Pacquiao. And that is evident by the fact that they were in talks with Manny Pacquiao and their talks fell apart in the beginning of 2010. And so Floyd fell back on fighting Shane Mosley. Okay? Mosley had expressed his desire to face Floyd Mayweather. Mosley had gone to Pacquiao. He did not succeed in facing Pacquiao. And so, uh, you know, getting the fight with Pacquiao. And so he went to Floyd Mayweather. And he bum-rushed him at the end of his fight with Juan Manuel Marquez. Okay? So, just so people know, it's not that Floyd Mayweather picked Oscar De La Hoya. No. Oscar De La Hoya was the pay-per-view star. He was the pay-per-view king. It's Oscar that picked Floyd. And they made the arrangement in 2007 to fight. As Larry Merchant so clearly stated. And then... Shane Mosley expressed his desire to face Floyd Mayweather in 2009 after he had defeated Antonio Barberito. Now, let's talk about the prime argument that people make, fighters in their prime. First of all, a fighter being in their physical prime is one thing. Take, for instance, Floyd Mayweather. Floyd Mayweather was at his physical prime or physical peak when he faced Arturo Gatti. That is when Floyd Mayweather was at his best. That was when he was in his prime. Floyd Mayweather's prime went from, you know, 1998 all the way up to 2005. After the Gatti fight, Floyd Mayweather, physically speaking, was not at his physical prime, okay? So that all of the exceptional name fights, the fight against Zab Judah, the fight against Carlos Baldomir, the fight against Oscar De La Hoya, and all the other names, Floyd was past his prime. That's a past his prime, Floyd Mayweather, okay? So the argument that Floyd did not face Shane Mosley in Shane Mosley's prime is kind of silly because Floyd wasn't even in his prime. That's the first argument. The second argument has to do with Shane Mosley. Though Shane Mosley was not in his prime, that is clearly evident in his physical prime, what we do know about Shane Mosley is the following. Now we know Shane Mosley, some will argue, was in his prime when he faced uh, Oscar De La Hoya. And the first time, he was in his prime. However, he was even in his prime when he faced Vernon Forrest twice. That was way back in 2002, but three years later, Shane Mosley, you can argue after he beat, was beaten by Winky, right? He was not in his prime anymore. But that doesn't mean that Shane Mosley wasn't at the top of his game. And you see that in the fact that he defeated Fernando Vargas, Luis Colazzo. When he faced Miguel Cotto, he got beaten fair and square by Miguel Cotto. And then he goes on to defeat Ricardo Mayorga. Let me show you a clip of Shane Mosley versus Ricardo Mayorga. Listen to the commentary team. There's something dramatic to happen here. Just as he did against Oscar De La Hoya eight years ago. Scintillating, fighting down the stretch of the fight by Shane Mosley. A brilliant point breaker. And he puts my arm on the game. Five, six, seven, eight. Look at the ball. It could have took a while. Because Shane Mosley came up with some of that old 12 ground back. It's a knockout, the left hook. It's a knockout. He finally got it. Brilliant stop by Shane Mosley. Shane Mosley, I love you. You couldn't get it more spectacular and more like Shane Mosley than that. That was spectacular, okay? And Shane Mosley hits like a mule, okay? So Shane Mosley comes back from his lost to Miga Koto, where people thought he was all washed up and all that moves up in weight to super welterweight and knocks out Ricardo Mayorga. The next fight that Mosley had was against Antonio Margarito. I want you to listen to the announcers in the broadcast as I play this little clip of the fight. Shane has better hands for I believe that Shane's going to still have to win. Another Margarito is stunned by the right hand. Margarito has not thrown since Shane landed that combination. Mosley has Margarito in trouble on the rope. Stackers him with that right hand. He's about one more right hand away from going down. And he doesn't 
know how to counter use that survival that most fighters do. He's not used to being in this position. That was a knockdown. He went into the rope. And there's the knockdown. Here you see the left hand that hurt Margarito. He shot the uppercut and he comes back with a left that hit all of the power because he got and then after that it was just a matter of falling through. And this is another left hook. The chain is lunging forward with full force and weight on all of his punches. There. Round nine of a scheduled twelve. Two point round for Mosley in the last round. Margarito would have no chance to win this fight on a decision. Must have a knockout if he's going to maintain his position in the division. Shane Mosley at age 37 is trying to become the number one welterweight in the world. And that's the way he'd be recognized if he can beat this man in the way that he's beating him right now. Margarita has no defense in all of their punches. This fight could be stopped any second now. Margarito is getting hit flush with every right hand. There's another one. There's a big left hook. Why not stop it now? And there's the right town from the corner. And Shane Mosley has annihilated Antonio Margarita. Can that man fight? That was the performance that Shane Mosley put on Antonio Margarito, a guy who had never been knocked out, was the guy that was supposedly the fair dude in the welterweight division after he destroyed Miga Koto. Never mind, he was cheating with hand wraps. And Shane Mosley, as you heard, it was for the number one welterweight spot, Shane Mosley knocked him out. This was the Shane Mosley that faced Floyd Mayweather. Okay? This was at welterweight, and it was for the number one welterweight spot in the world because I told you Margarita had beaten Miga Cotto. Like I said, the Ring Magazine has it all wrong. When Pacquiao beat Cotto, he didn't become the number one welterweight in the world. It was actually uh, Shane Mosley who beat Antonio Margarita to become the number one welterweight in the world. He was also the WBA Super World Welterweight Champion at the same time. Floyd Mayweather faced that Shane Mosley. He was 37 years of age, yeah. But I'm telling you right now, that Shane Mosley was devastating. Shane Mosley went to Manny Pacquiao's trainer, Freddie Roach, and, and Bob Arum, and they to try and make a deal to fight Manny Pacquiao. And Freddie Roach said, well, it was catch weight, 145. Mosley was like, no deal. So they, they never had a deal. And Freddie Roach said this. He said, he's too good for us. We had to get some kind of leverage, some kind of advantage. He had a, a sensational performance. And he was, when Floyd Mayweather faced him, the number one welterweight in the world. You can't get better than that. He was at the pinnacle of his performance. Two straight back-to-back -back knockouts. Okay? So anyone telling you that, you know, it's about the fighter being in their prime is really stupid. You have to look at the performance of the, the fighter and you have to look at the status or the standing of the fighter with respect to his division, okay? Shane Mosley wasn't washed up when Floyd Mayweather faced him. We can't say that after Floyd Mayweather faced him, Shane Mosley wasn't washed up because Shane Mosley had a very poor performances after he faced Floyd Mayweather. You see here. He got a draw with Shoji Mora, where he should have probably lost that fight. Okay. However, Mora did come in overweight. Then he had a somewhat competitive fight with Manny Pacquiao until he was dropped. Then he was on his back pedal. He had a pretty competitive fight with Saul Canelo Alvarez as well. But, of course, by that time, people thought Mosley was washed up. He beat Pablo Cesar Cano, and then he lost to Anthony Mundine. And then people knew he was washed up, right? Uh, he beat Ricardo Mayorga a second time, but Mar Ricardo Mayorga was also washed up as a fighter by that time. He beat some guy named Patrick Lopez. We don't even know who that is. And then he lost to David Avanesian. Avanesian is a meh, he's a mediocre fighter. I most, mostly lost to him. My point being this, Mosley wasn't washed up when he faced Floyd Mayweather. Now, post Floyd Mayweather, we can say, uh, because you could just look at his performances and see that he was washed up, but not before Floyd Mayweather faced him. 
The irony of the situation is Manny Pacquiao faced a Shane Mosley, who was not a world champion, who was not the number one welterweight in the world at the time. And Mosley was coming off of a very mediocre performance against Sergey Mora, who, we could argue, beat him. Don't be so naive that you think that uh, Mayweather was a cherry picker and he was trying to cherry pick his, his career. No. It just so happened that those fighters were not interested in facing Floyd Mayweather. Though Floyd Mayweather was interested in them. They were the stars. They were the guys with a reputation, not Floyd. So Floyd couldn't call any shots. Now let's talk about Oscar De La Hoya. Now first of all, when Floyd made that statement, Oscar De La Hoya, he was in retirement. Bernard Hopkins had knocked him out. It was a competitive fight to some degree. Hopkins was winning it. But Hopkins caught him with a liver shot. Oscar went down and he just couldn't come back up. So he was on hiatus for almost two years. When he came out from his hiatus in 2006, he faced Ricardo Mayorga. That was May 6th of 2006. And in round five, Delaware had a 16 to 7 edge in Power Connect. According to CompuBox, he also landed 10 of 23 jabs. It was another brilliant round for Delaware. But to me, it seems aside from the jab, a lot of those exciting punches are not really landing that cleanly on Mayaga like they used to be. If you land in the jab, a lot of the punches he's barely missing. I think that's again because he's got Mayorga backing up. Exactly. More yeah. defensive. Mayorga is much more conscious of trying to get away from Delaware's punches. Delaware got his respect in the first round. Well, maybe he just got into the rhythm of Oscar's punches or whatever it was, but I, I'm looking at it, he's not getting hit that clean anymore. Well, Floyd Mayweather is getting hit right now. Floyd Mayweather is getting hit right now. Almost landed another blow to the back of Deloia's head. Now there's a straight right hand shot that landed on Deloia's forehead. Oscar De La Hoya's performance before he faced Floyd Mayweather. And if he didn't look incredible to you, I don't know what to say. Because y'all gotta be crazy. Now, I want to say these things to let people know. Yeah, Oscar was past his prime. But when you look at him versus Mayorga, when you look at him versus even Bernard Hopkins or Felix Stern, Oscar was just moving levels up and up. The only guys that gave Oscar problems were guys like Shane Mosley, okay? And then you can argue that he actually beat Shane Mosley in the second fight. You can argue he beat Felix Trinidad. Of course, Oscar was at the peak of his performance against Ike Corte. I think that was that, I think that was where he was at his prime. You know, his prime began somewhere against Jimmy Bredow, who was a boxer kind of type. Oscar was KOing and everybody, and I think it peaked at Ike Corte. I think that was his greatest fight. And then he wasn't peaked anymore. But at the end of the day, it's only a handful of people that beat Oscar De La Hoya. Felix Trinidad. And you can argue that Oscar beat him. Shane Mosley. Mosley definitely beat him the first time in split decision, but I thought Oscar got the second fight. When you look at it, only Mosley... Felix Trinidad and Bernard Hopkins had beaten Oscar when Floyd Mayweather Jr. stepped up and faced him. I want you guys to understand what I'm saying. And Oscar's performance against Ricardo Mayorga, which was at Super Welterweight, to win the WBC Super Welterweight crown back, 
was impressive, spectacular, and sensational. You saw classic Oscar De La Hoya. You saw classic Oscar. All right? That's the Oscar De La Hoya Floyd Mayweather faced. The point is, people talk about Oscar was not in his prime when he faced Floyd Mayweather and Muhammad Ali faced the guy in his prime. Look, man, that, that argument is overrated, and I keep on saying that over and over again. What's important is, is this fighter maintaining their status in their respective division? Oscar De La Hoya was not the best super welterweight in his division at the time. But what's important for people to understand is he was in the top 10 super welterweights in the world with that one win. And his performance the fight before showed this. Oscar De La Hoya and Shane Mosley, when they faced Floyd Mayweather, they were world champions. With respect to the opponents that they faced, Oscar De La Hoya came straight out of his break and faced Ricardo Mayorga. Just think about that. No ring rust, none, none of that. Now, Ricardo Mayorga. Ricardo Mayorga faced Oscar De La Hoya after he had lost to Felix Trinidad, who had been, he had been knocked out in the eighth round against Felix Trinidad, tough guy. And he had lost to Corey Spinks. Those were the two losses. Before that, he was an undefeated world champion. Beat Vernon Forrest, beat Andrew Sixhead Lewis. Big, those were huge wins, and he managed to do his unorthodox style, but he lost to Corey Spinks by majority decision. And then, just uh, a couple fights later, he lost to Felix Trinidad by TKO. All right? And that's basically it for him. Oscar De La Hoya faced him, and Oscar De La Hoya was the quickest to knock him out. Quickest to knock him out. 2006, he knocked him out in the sixth round. Shane Mosley took 12 rounds to knock out Ricardo Mayorga. He fought him after. Okay. When Oscar faced Ricardo Mayorga, he, he had two legitimate losses on his record to world champions. It was Felix Trinidad and Corey Spinks. It was a legitimate win for Oscar De La Hoya. With respect to Shane Mosley, when Shane Mosley faced Antonio Margarita, Antonio Margarita was coming off of a tremendous win against Miga Cotto. He had beaten Kermit Cintron to become the IBF World Welterweight Champion, but then he faced Miga Cotto next, so he was stripped of the IBF title, and he won the WBA World Welterweight title because he beat Miga Cotto, who was the number one welterweight contender in the world, just below the lineal champion, Floyd Mayweather Jr. in 2007. After Antonio Margarito beat him, Antonio Margarito became the number one welterweight in the world. Okay, he had lost to Paul Williams, but he regained another title. The WBO title, he lost to Paul Williams. Okay, he had beaten Joshua Clotty, Kermit Cintron, okay. The only other guy to outbox him was a southpaw from Puerto Rico named Daniel Santos. He had beaten Andrew Sixheads Lewis as well. Okay, knocked him out actually in the second round. Antonio Margarita is a long reigning welterweight champion. When Shane Mosley came down from super welterweight to face him, and Shane Mosley knocked him out, Shane Mosley became the number one welterweight in the world for yet, I think, a second time. Because Shane Mosley, when he beat Oscar De La Hoya the first time, he was the number one welterweight in the world. So I want you to understand the significance of the level of opposition these guys actually faced. They were at the top of their game when they faced Floyd Mayweather. The argument about a fighter being in their physical prime is not everything. When you have passed your physical prime, you have to find other ways and means to continue your career and Floyd Mayweather found those ways and means to do so. Antonio Margarito, by the way, was not past his physical prime when Shane Mosley faced him. And that's very important for people to understand. Also, Ricardo Mayorga had just become world champion himself. Ricardo Mayorga had beaten Michelle Piccarillo to become the WBC Super Welterweight Champion of the World. And then Oscar beat Ricardo Mayor. This was his third world championship. My point being this. These guys, you can't say, were at the top of their game when Manny Pacquiao faced them. You could say they were washed up. Shane Mosley hasn't put on a performance like he used to just before facing Floyd Mayweather. Before Mayweather, Shane Mosley was at the top of his game because he was at the top of the welterweight division. But there's a difference between talking about a fighter in their physical prime and a fighter who's at the top of his game. 
when Rocky Marciano fought Joe Lewis, Joe Lewis wasn't at the top of his game. Joe Lewis was washed up. Boxers don't need to be in their physical prime to still be at the top of their game. There are many boxers who are not in their physical prime anymore. And Floyd Mayweather Jr. is a perfect example of that. You guys are great.